Welcome to A Word Fitly Spoken, a podcast about Jesus, His Word, and our joy in following Him. I'm Amy Spreeman. And I'm Michelle Leslie. Thank you for joining us. Well, we want to kick this episode off with a very special shout out. One of our sweet listeners tweeted us last week to let us know that her 17-month-old little girl, Edith, gets so excited when she hears a word fitly spoken come on because she loves to dance to our music. In fact, Edith's, Edith's mama said, I have to keep rewinding it so I don't throw off her groove. <laughs> That's what she said. So, Edie, Edie, come over here, honey. Come over here. <laughs> Edie, we just want you to know that Auntie Amy and Nanny Michelle love you. You just keep Uh, dancing and you keep listening to A Word Fitly Spoken and you grow up into a godly young lady. And I say Nanny Michelle because that's what we call, that's what we call like uh, the little kids around here call their godmothers nanny or real close friends of the family or a special aunt or whatever. So down here, it's Nanny Michelle. Love love it, love it. (laughs) Y'all have any special terms like that? No, there. no, but I really like when you folks from Louisiana say Miss Amy. I, I like being called Miss Amy. I think that's just the <laughs> sweetest thing. But Edie, uh, we, I, that's just so cool. I saw that tweet last week, too, and I was so excited. We were hoping to get a video of it, but apparently Edie's a little camera shy. So, <laughs> <laughs> But I bet she's adorable. We love you, Edie. Yes. And uh, if, if you would like to send us pictures or videos of your kids dancing to our music or of you listening to a word fitly spoken or comments or whatever, we are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and you can find the direct links for all of those at a word fitly spoken dot life. Amen. Well, in this episode, we're, we're going to talk about a trend in the church that borrows mystical elements from Buddhism and Hinduism and melds or syncretizes them into Christian practices. Mysticism in the church is as old as the church itself and has been rightly called out over the centuries as unbiblical. But it is a trend in our time as many Christians are now bringing these practices into the church and normalizing them. Oh, they sure are, Michelle. Mysticism in the church is one of those things that to many believers sounds right or almost right. And it's really become a mystical mess. I've been looking at uh, mysticism in the church uh, for many years and have interviewed a lot of people who've come out of the new age. And one thing that you might be thinking as we're talking about this is, well, don't you believe believe in miracles and mystery? And to that, of course, we agree, yes, God is supernatural and his miracles are incredible. You know, our gospel, the good news of Jesus's birth, death, resurrection, and eventual return has power in truth. And that's what God uses to redeem us and regenerate our souls. A gospel that can save a sinner from eternal hell is a miracle. Yes, indeed. So God's miracles happen every day. And we, of course, course, affirm that. So why the warnings then about mysticism? You might ask, isn't it the same thing as miracles? Well, actually, no. There is a stark difference between God's supernatural power and his miracles and the mystical practices many professing Christians use to experience something of God. You know, those practices include using techniques from those false religions, like Michelle mentioned, to uh, New Age practices and elements, and even sorcery or dark art. That's right. It's really, wouldn't you say it's kind of a, a counterfeit of God's miracles and and, uh, and spirituality that's Christian? Um, yeah, I, absolutely. I think that's what I Bunny would say. Bunny ears around the Christian. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but but uh, but things are truly biblical are not uh, involved in new age stuff and things like that. So what is mysticism? That word is derived from the Greek mystikos, meaning the occult knowledge veiled in mystery that can only be known through subjective experience. Mystics are those who, through contemplative, meditative techniques, attain altered states of consciousness beyond the thinking mind to experience unmediated union with the divine, the all, the source, the universal, the force, the energy, or the void. Did you know that New Age thinkers who call themselves Christians believe that there will eventually be a progressive unification of world consciousness? It's also called Christ consciousness, or as Oprah Winfrey says, uh, she calls it Christ consciousness, that will bring all of us together regardless, regardless of whether we are born again or not. 
These ideas are not found in scripture, but many Christians think they are because of what they've been taught. And those who don't know what the Bible teaches about God's nature will often fall for New Age mysticism. Of course, we all want to experience God. We want to believe more in his power, his love, and whatever takes us into the realm beyond what we can see. Hebrews 11.1 1 says this, Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So faith is simply believing in in Christ as God himself, along with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and trusting in him alone for our salvation and sanctification. But many people want more. We've talked many times on this program about the importance of the sufficiency of Scripture as our only authority for knowing the nature and character of God, and how oftentimes people want to turn to other methods of authority and signs. It's as if to say to God, your word is not enough for me. You know, where have we heard that before? And so we'll see Christians using pagan practices and dabbling in the New Age practices of Hinduism and Buddhism. And sadly, a lot of it comes through the church doors from women, bringing in teachings on Reiki and chakras, crystals, uh, magic energy oils, yoga, karma, energy fields, and things of this nature. And I'm sure a lot of our, our listeners are sitting there thinking, you know, rolling their eyes and thinking, yeah, I've, I've heard of all that before. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Michelle, and add to that list, uh, a long list, uh, Christian-y, and I'm putting, again, quotations or scare quotes or bunny ears around Christian, right. <laughs> but Christian-y sounding Ouija boards and Christian tarot cards. You know, a few years ago, it's it's so shocking. Bethel Church in Redding, California, and a ministry called Christ Alignment uh, promoted something called Destiny Cards, uh, and they look exactly like like we like the tarot cards. But these right. are designed to do psychic readings to get in touch with the Holy Spirit for supernatural healing, and to do readings on how you can control your destiny in areas like you know jobs and relationships and that kind of thing. It's basically divination with a churchy like covering. Of course, like you said earlier, Michelle, it's uh, you know definitely a counterfeit. Now these cards were created by a woman named Jen Hodges and we're going to put a link up on our show notes so that you can see them for yourself and then you can also hear what she says about them and then compare to scripture. But some Christians are even using a version of the Ouija board to get in touch with angels. You know, they think it's okay because angels are in heaven, right? Well, the board is called Angels Talk, the message board that connects you to your angels. Oh boy. (laughs) You know, the device is used to communicate with spirits and looks almost like a, a Ouija board. I mean, it looks just the same with the numbers and letters and everything, only it has this ethereal looking female angel on board, you know, with her hair flowing and angel wings and things and the letters and the numbers there. Never mind that angels in scripture, at least the named ones that we know about, were always male, but I digress. (laughs) Yeah, and I remember um, Doreen Virtue has told us that she designed her own angel cards when she was in the New Age. And so that's something else to watch out for. I mean, you might find come across a deck of those cards and think, oh, well, they're angels, so it must be okay, must be biblical, but but it's not. That's really something that uh, people in the New Age use. So you have to really be careful and compare everything to Scripture. And these, you know, these things are frightening, these things that Amy was just talking about and, and that I've named off too. But, you know, the Bible tells us that these methods of divination are an abomination to God. So let's let's look at what Scripture has to say about that. Let's let's think about these verses that I'm about to read here. Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 14 says this. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord because of these same detestable and because of these same detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. The nations you will dispossess listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. That's pretty straightforward right there. Yes, it is. Leviticus 19.31 says, 
Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 20 verse 6. I will set my face against anyone who, who turns to mediums and spiritists to prostitute themselves by following them, and I will cut them off from their people. 1 Chronicles 10, 13, Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He did not keep the word of the Lord and even consulted a medium for guidance. And then we'll turn over to the New Testament, Re Revelation 21, 8, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. So this is pretty yeah. serious stuff here. God, God's not, you know, just saying, oh, this kind of thing is okay. You know, it's, it's right. fine. It's no big deal. You just do what you want. Do what is right in your own eyes. No, that this kind of thing takes people to hell. He's very serious about this. He doesn't want us using any of these idolatrous, magical, witchcrafty types of things. Yes. Um, Amy, you had an experience recently with a woman who was a Christian psychic. Not that there is any <laughs> such thing, but tell us about that. Yeah, uh, Michelle, it was a couple years ago up here in you know small town, Wisconsin. I mean, I'm talking really small town. And uh, I was in a salon and another customer and I began to talk about our shared faith as Christians. Um, I'd never seen her before. She said she was new in town, just moved here. Uh, she was looking for someone to help her set up her husband's website. And uh, so that perked my ears right up. I, I do that sort of thing. And she had some sort of a business as well as a Christian ministry. And she said, uh, and I, I told her, you know, I do websites and I'd be happy to talk more. And so on the way out the door, she handed me her old business card from California, and her title on the card was Christian Psychic. <laughs> you could just imagine what was going through my mind, Michelle. It was, uh, I, I was just kind of deer in the headlights for a second there. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. I mean, I would not know what to say to somebody who had a title like that. I mean, it's, well, kind, yeah. it's kind of an oxymoron if you think about it. After the verses that we just read, you cannot, it's like saying, I'm a Christian adulterer, I'm a Christian murderer. I'm I mean, it's it's that serious. It really is. And she invited me to her home uh, later on in the week to check out their uh, their new small business, which her uh, her husband ran in California, and he he was going to be moving that to their farm. And so um, I went. And uh, I was armed. Uh, no, not with a <laughs> firearm, but I'll explain more in a second. But it was a really cute place. I mean, it was nice and big and spacious for the new business. And uh, her husband showed us around. And uh, I, I couldn't wait to talk to her alone about you know, what she had told me. But anyway, you know, I was, it was we a field talking about trip, websites. right? Yeah, exactly. It was a field trip. It was, you know, the, the niceties before, um, you know, before we were going to get down to business here. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we were uh, sitting on a couch in, in their living room and talking about the website and things. And then he excused himself. And um, so it was just the two of us, you know, so here we're going to talk. And she pulls out four decks of very large cards and says, Amy, I really want to do a reading on you. There's something about you. I can just sense something. I'm thinking, I bet you can. I'll bet. But <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yes. And so and the they spirit were, they you're were... looking for. It's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know it. So uh, she wanted to do this reading and she had actual tarot cards. I mean, I looked at oh, them. I, I'd seen them, you know, what they looked like before. I knew what they were. You know, they were tarot cards. And I you know, said very politely, well, no, thanks. But can we talk instead about about our faith in Jesus, you know, and, and she kind of, I, I could tell by her body language, she was kind of bristling a little bit. And so I said, you know, um, do you mind if I ask you a question about, you know, your tarot cards and, and your, um, your psychic business that you have there? And she said, okay, you know, I, I figured this was coming. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I said, well, uh, okay, how do you reconcile your Christian faith with um, something that God has so clearly said you must not do? And I wasn't mean or anything like that. And um, she went into her story. She said, well, even from when I was a, a really young girl, I could always see things. I could see the spirit world. Uh, I was a seer and I had this gift I knew came from God, which of course it didn't. But uh, you know, I, I wanted to do something to help people with this with this gift that I had. So um, I learned how to be a, a Christian psychic. Um, you know, she had grown up and uh, didn't know her Bible really, you could tell. But, but she also had a sense that she knew it was wrong. It was really uh, troubling her. And 
And uh, she had even in her previous town, Michelle, been called a witch when mm. uh, she went into a church. Uh, she was invited in to talk to you know, women's groups and, and do readings there. Can you imagine? Oh, now, just goodness. sidebar, a, a women's ministry at a church invited in a Christian psychic to do tarot card readings. So this is what we're dealing with in the church mm. today. But um, but anyway, uh, you know, she was called a witch and she was told, you know, that that she was evil and all of this, which, of, of course, is true. Um, but but it, it didn't exactly help. You know, I'm quite sure they didn't share the gospel with her. Or if they did, she didn't, you know, didn't hear it, wasn't able to hear it. And so she said she went home and she didn't know what to do. She was in a crisis. And so she talked to her uncle, who happened to be a uh, Catholic priest, retired. <laughs> And she asked her uncle, you know, can I, can I do that my Christian psychic business and, and not feel guilty about it? And he said, well, let me ask you a question. Are you doing this for Jesus? And she said, yes. And so he said, well, then you're fine. No guilt. You, you need to, you need to do this. This is your calling. And so this is what she was told by an alleged man of the cloth. And this is how she came to be where she was. And so um, then it was my turn and I started sharing a little bit more about scripture. I had with me, I, I said I was armed. I had uh, a tract and then I also had printed off this three page, ba- you know, both sides of the paper testimony from our friend Marsha Montenegro, who has Christian answers from the new age. And ladies, if, if that name sounds familiar, uh, she was just on a, our, our program a, a couple episodes back talking about the Enneagram, the Enneagram, however you say it. She, she was talking about that because she was an astrologer. She was heavily into the new age. She did people's readings. Um, and her story was about how Jesus Christ changed her life forever. Uh, she became born again. And so I wanted to leave this story with her and she refused it and said, no, um, please don't. And by the way, I don't think it's going to work out for you to uh, work with us on this website. So anyway, she showed me to the door and that was that. So anyway, but that Shocker. was my experience with, but but it's the, the thing that struck me is just how sad uh, I was for her and, and for yeah. these church ladies in her past who had actually invited her in. Um, nobody seemed to know that this was wrong or unbiblical and, yeah. uh, you know, and, and how she was treated. Okay. I, you know, yes, she was, you know, doing something very evil and wrong. However, you know, did anyone ever explain to her um, the nature and character of God and those Bible verses? And so, yeah, it, it's a troubling story all around. And I'm not going to say her name, but I, I would just ask you ladies to pray for her because, you know, she's still in my small town. She's still doing mm-hmm. her thing. And so um, as far as I know, uh, she's still very lost. So please pray for her. Yeah, absolutely do that. And I think there's there's really a couple of, of lessons that we as as Christian women can learn from this. The first thing we need to understand is not to just take things at face value that call themselves Christians. Just right. because someone says she's a Christian doesn't nece- necessarily mean that she is. And just because some product or program or book or something like that says that it's Christian doesn't mean that it is. Um, so always keep the gospel front and center and always, you know, talk to people about what they believe because, um, you know, I, I, I've witnessed to people before that they've, or I've talked to people before that said that they were Christians. And I said, oh, you know, what's your, what's your understanding of the gospel? And it was just, oh, be a good person and you'll go to heaven, you know? So yes. if you just take it face value that something is Christian, you might miss an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody. Um, and if you believe something is Christian, just because it says it is like a book or a program or something, um, you could end up being deceived. You could end up learning false doctrine and that's not something you want to to get into. So you, we really need to be careful not to just um, take things at face value that say that they're Christian. And then the other thing is, you know, if you listen to what Amy was saying about this lady, she didn't know her Bible very well. And she did not, it sounds like she did not grow up in a doctrinally sound, good, strong, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. And so it all, all of these things, a lot of these things, always go back to the sufficiency of scripture and the authority of scripture too. We talk a lot about, um, about, uh, the sufficiency of scripture, but a lot of times we fail to talk about the authority of scripture. And what I mean by the authority of scripture, what we mean when we say that is if you're a Christian, 
Scripture is the authority by which you live your life. Scripture dictates how you're to behave, how you're to think, how you're to feel, what you're to do. And we come to Scripture and we submit to it. We don't come to Scripture and go, well, I think I like this, so I'll I'll obey this, but I don't like this part over here, so I'm not going to obey that, and I'm going to believe something different about that than what God's Word says. Right. No, we come to Scripture and we bow the knee, uh, not literally to like worship your Bible. I don't mean that. I just mean we submit our will to what God says in his word. And we we don't look for those things that are outside of scripture. You know, the sufficiency of scripture is also important, but we just need to make sure we don't forget the authority of scripture as well. And we need to study our Bibles and be good students of God's word so that when stuff like this comes along, we will have his word hidden in our hearts to to just to know that when we hear something like that, it's it's not we know it's not biblical because we've already got that word hidden in our hearts. So yes. those are some good lessons to to remember from a lot of these things that we're talking about. Exactly, Michelle. And the thing to remember, ladies, about authority is authority doesn't share. What I That's mean by right. that is uh, authority alone. So scripture alone is your authority. It's not scripture and what a priest says or and what uh, a tradition says. It, it's scripture alone is your authority for understanding the nature and character of who God is, uh, why Jesus came, uh, what happened on the cross, what he accomplished, and, and what he is continuing to do and will do. So uh, again, authority is singular here. It's That's not right. plural. <laughs> so got to keep that in mind. But you know, Michelle, this New Age movement in the church tries to convince us that we can be just like God by tapping into his supernatural power to enhance our lives, which of course is a huge lie from the enemy. Or it convinces us that there are secrets in the Bible that you must unlock. And these new age YouTube stars posing as Christian gurus just happen to have discovered the key, right? So um, it's it's a, a mess out there. Mystical divination and impressions are also being introduced through prayer programs into the church. Like uh, there's one called the soaking prayer or soaking in the spirit, which is really transcendental meditation set to music that goes on and on and on and on and it gets you into a trance. Um, that was really popular in charismatic churches or in around uh, 2013. Uh, I, I reported on this back then when television host Sid Roth, and by the way, not recommended, right. um, introduced it on his show. It was picked up by Charisma Magazine, uh, also not recommended, and other so-called Christian publications, and it just took off from there. Um I'll explain what transcendental meditation is, but please don't do this as I explain this. It's a technique that's achieved by having you get into a relaxed position. Usually, you know, you're you're laying on the floor in a, a comfy chair so that you can completely let go of all of your physical body. Uh, again, please don't do this. Uh, but you, you think about the feelings in your limbs, your muscles, your tummy, your neck, and you just uh, slowly relax everything and let it all go. And then once you let go of the physical, once you do that, you are taught to empty your mind, empty it of all thoughts, anxiety, emotions, memories, all of it. Now, um, and, and just to make clear, you are never to empty your mind in, in scripture. God never says that. Right. But anyway, what the New Agers do is they want you to make your mind a blank slate so that you can receive impressions from the divine or the spirit world. You know, people who teach this can get participants to believe that they've visited heaven. I mean, the actual real, you know, they take trips to heaven or they've seen people who died and talked to them. Now, that's called necromancy, by the way, also forbidden in the Bible. Or, you know, they'll have some sort of out-of-body experience, very common in these transcendental meditation sessions. Uh, this transcendental meditation is something I did as a kid growing up in the Unitarian Church. Uh, I remember several times during Sunday services that we would do this right in the pews. Uh, again, it would right during the sermon. Well, <laughs> no sermon that was going on, but but there would be the soft music playing and you'd get lost in it. And, you know, no sermons were there, but it was just the instructions and a very soft voice from the leader on how to get there. And then the silence. But, you know, again, Michelle, the Bible never tells us to empty our minds. We are to 
be sober-minded. A couple of verses from 1 Peter, uh, in verse uh, 5, 8, it says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And then 4, 7 says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Yeah, we really need to be aware of these tactics. And if you see any of these things in your churches, I mean, especially if people are lying down on the pews during the sermon and (laughs) and relaxing and emptying their minds, I'm pretty sure your pastor won't like that. So, you know, (laughs) but anyway, not But to be serious, you really do need to alert your church leadership if you see any of these things going on, especially if it has kind of sneaked into your women's ministry or something like that and the pastor's not aware of it. And let me also just say, if you alert your pastor to something that's going on, and it's, you know, it's definitely something unbiblical, not just something maybe that you don't know enough about, uh, but it's, you've compared it with scripture and scripture says no, and you're, you tell your pastor about it and he doesn't care, or he thinks you're making too big of a deal of it, or he, he's the one who instigated it or something like that. You probably need to find yourself a new church, so just be aware yeah, of that. and you're not alone yeah right. that that's happened to me before too i i actually uh went to a, a pastor and an elder at one point and uh did explain about some new age things happening in the church and that <laughs> i was told i'm yeah i i was making a big deal out of it and i had a critical spirit so ladies it, it happens and it's just time to move on right absolutely and and do um you know just be careful when you go and talk to your pastor and everything be sure you know what you're talking about. I mean, we need to have a good balance of being alert and being uh, discerning, but we also need to be sure we know what we're talking about and we know what scripture says and we're able to handle God's word correctly so that we don't, um, so that we don't make a mistake about something and call something new age that's not and and be up in arms about something that actually is not unbiblical. So, so just be careful about that. But, but we do need to be, um, we do need to be vigilant and and make sure that uh, these things don't creep into our churches. But a lot of these, these new age mystical practices are being done outside of the church buildings. And you may never see your sisters in Christ practicing these things unless you visit their homes or you see what they post on social media. You see who they follow on social media and things of that nature. There are a lot of these gurus with huge followings who call themselves Christians, but do not have a church or at least not a biblically sound church where they're taught about sin judgment, repentance, holiness, and all of those things. Instead, they're deceived uh, and and are believing that they've come to a new understanding of themselves by tapping into the hidden powers of the universe. They don't really desire biblical Christianity, and eventually they will trap others into their, their snare of disbelief. Um, We're going to put some excellent resources in our show notes that you can read and share with anyone who's ensnared by New Age mysticism. Yeah, and we encourage you to do that. Sometimes these conversations are hard to have, Michelle, but... Um, you know, we're, we're in an age right now, uh, where I, I, I've always said it's, it's the great falling away. I mean, I know that there's been other times in history where that's happened, but boy, it sure is happening in our time, isn't it? It certainly is. And it's, it's very depressing and very scary. And, and, you know, we don't know exactly what's going to happen next. I mean, we could be entering another era of the dark ages or who knows what, if maybe the Lord will come back, that would be my vote. I would vote for the Lord to come back next. (laughs) Uh, But whatever happens, we don't have to worry about that because all of this is in God's hands, right? And so, uh, you know, we're not to worry or fret. We are to keep our eyes on Jesus. We are to be in his word and just be comforted in knowing that God is sovereign and, uh, and, and we are his. So as we wrap up, the truth, of course, is yes, our God is supernatural. You know, Jesus showed us many miracles and he enabled and empowered his apostles too. He did that as a sign to unbelievers to prove his deity. So the supernatural nature of God will always be part of our Christian faith, but new age mysticism has no place in our churches. So head on over to our website, a word fitly spoken dot life for all those resources. And until next time, be sober-minded, trust in the word, and walk worthy. 